of the, the, the project. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, the, the project uh, that's uh, been on uh, my priorities list lately, the project I'm developing uh, here at uh, Sergi Paris University, at the uh, Agora Lab, and also here at the uh, Advanced Studies Institute. And it has kind of a, a tricky name. Uh, and for those those who should feel it's very straightforward, but it's not the case for a, 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 not a wider audience. So I'll spend some time explaining what, what is this and where I'm coming from, what is the community I'm speaking uh, about. So it's called Energetics and Central European Economic Thought. So, and, and the first clue is that, so I am a historian of economic thought. So this is a, uh, so there's a community uh, of uh, most of us, some historians, but most of us also economists who uh, dedicate themselves to the history of their fields, right? History of economics. And uh, it entails on one hand side, the, on one hand, the, the history of, of science, right? Economics as, as a scientific field. So the narratives, representations, and the, the, the context, the, the sociological context around the discipline, but also it's about history of ideas, intellectual history. So it's about the rational reconstruction about how ideas uh, arise, how they die, and what they actually mean in their own context. So the history of economic thought is this community which sort of gathers this, all these different perspectives to look into uh, past economic ideas. So I, I'm going to start with this with this painting, uh, which is um, along the process on the construction of this project. This is all the way back in, in the start. So this is on, on, on my first book. And it appears there in the beginning. It's a, a painting from 1836 by Thomas Cole, which was a very, very well-known painter, painter from the River Hudson School. So this painting is actually at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And it actually, depicts a, a, some, it's an allegory, right? For this wider process of how humans and nature interact. So on the right side, what we see is domesticated nature, right? So we see it's a very stable environment. You, you see in the background smokes and agriculture, some houses. So it's this very, um, it's an allusion to the mastery of nature by humans. So it's something that, rises very strongly with modernity itself, really connected to enlightenment, and this idea of uh, the humanist idea of um, how we can actually control uh, nature to our own purposes. So this is sort of a, an instrumental view of nature. And on the left side, what we see is actually this very powerful and vibrant nature, lots of un, uh, impetuous forces of storm, and this very lush and green nature. And the author actually, he painted himself, he's right here in the middle of the world, Northampton. You can see actually he painted himself in the picture and actually shows a more contemplative approach to, to nature. Uh, it's been related to the concept of Arcadia as well, this Arcadian notion of nature and how we actually are part of it. So this is sort of a pushback against the enlightenment and this view of human emancipating from nature and instead seeing us as a part of nature, right? And this is um, this contemplative uh, view of nature. Then it's uh, as a pushback again against enlightenment, it's been picked up by currents such as romanticism, idealism, and so forth. So this is a little bit of a, a warming up to what I'm, I'm about to say, because there's different worldviews of how humans and science relate to nature, then they trickle down over time, also to the scientific fields that we have had in, in the last few years, in, in decades and centuries, right? So there is two kind of different views. So in first, we have this dualism between humans and nature, this instrumental based on enlightenment, the mastery of uh, science uh, upon nature. So in which we have actually the natural environment as separated from social systems, political systems, and um, this would be the conventional view because it's still sort of the mainstream. So the, the hegemonic, I'd say, view of how humans have actually um, related to nature and also the source of many of the problems that we are ex now experiencing, right? So now we're getting the check for this kind of view. 
And on the right side, we have this other embedded view in which how we provide for ourselves, right? The economy is embedded within society, political systems, and in turn, we are embedded in the natural environment. And when we think about the economic thought and the history of economic thought, we can sort of give, make this separation and change. So the environmental economics would sort of spouse the first view as the, the, the whole mainstream of economics. So for instance, there is this the notion of an externality. So every negative environmental effect of an economic activity in standard economics is seen as an externality, right? So this is a hint that it's seen as something external to markets, it's external to the economy. And on, so ecology, ecology economists, what they're trying to do is to break away from this view and actually depict uh, economy as something that cannot abstain or be separated from biophysical limits, for example. So this was the preamble for what is ecology economics and my take on the history of ecology economics, right? In institutional terms, a very recent field. So the International Society has been created in 1988. It's a very new uh, discipline, very inter interdisciplinary. So they're not all of them economists. Actually, I would say that a third or a fourth are ecologists, evolutionary biologists, geographers. So, so it's a very interdisciplinary group. But they have converged around this quest against economic growth at all costs. Again, as a result of that dual view of humans and nature as sort of uh, leading us to, into pathways which are very unstable, which, which are very detrimental and very dangerous really for um, the, the way that we organize ourselves and etc. So there is this early history of the more of modern ecological economics, which has arisen with uh, the environmental movements of the 1960s and in which uh, there were Big names such as Nicholas Jesko Rogan, Herman Daly, Kenneth Paulding. So names uh, of the establishment which were actually breaking away and saying, well, economic growth as one of the main pillars of economic science is actually lead leading us to, into a path which we do not uh, believe is, is something positive. right? And the ideas that they have taken up actually have their origins all the way back into the 1880s, which um, not by coincidence is when the laws of thermodynamics were already being consolidated and actually spilling over into the social sciences. And I think it'll be clear when we look into this definition of the field as having a focus on the links between economics and ecology and described by means of the analysis of the flows and stocks of energy and matter. Right? So this is, this is the key component for ecological economies in which Energy is not just one sector of the economy, right? So it's not just like that sector over there, and then you have services and, and agriculture and, and industry. It's not just a sector of the economy. It's energy is actually the lifeblood that composes and constitutes uh, how we provide for ourselves. And of course, it also includes, and it's very important too, the implications for process of social provisioning and cultural development. So we talk a lot about this biophysical approach to economic science rather than the allocative approach of the mainstream, which is much more uh, connected to how to allocate goods and services in the economy, but actually to look into what are these goods and how they actually come to us and how can we provide ourselves without any sort of contradictions to what the natural science is actually telling us. For instance, physicists, chemists, climate sciences. So there's this book by Juan Martinez Salier from Barcelona, which is sort of the, the, the first and, and main book talking about the history of ecological economics. And in the book and in the field, you see that there is a strong emphasis on social energetics. It's a foundation of the field. So what is social energetics? So you have the, this picture here that you can see very clearly the flows of energy coming from either the sun or fossil fuels or minerals, and then they get processed within the boundaries of the social economic system. And this is how we actually survive, right? And there's also the, the sinks like emissions and, and waste, but also products and population, right? So this is, this is social energetics. The application of the laws of energetics, which are how the laws that govern how energy actually flows in a, in a given uh, system, applied to the social realm. 
So based on that, so this first book, which I've uh, written uh, in co-authorship with uh, Antoine Mismer, uh, here from, from Cirette, uh, also based in Paris. So when we were looking into this wider history of ecological economics, then we said, well, but I think it's, we, we would rather have something a little bit more structured and formal in what actually constitutes this history. You do not want this just to be whatever ecological economists are doing today, and what just get these ideas back into the past, right? So this retrospective approach to what ecological economists do and think today. So we said, well, maybe we need to extrapolate a little bit that beyond uh, this, this stops and flows of matter and see how does it, how does economics actually interact with each of the natural sciences, right? And so we spent a lot of time trying to come up with this uh, definition of what is ecological economic thought, which is something that actually didn't exist before in the literature. Right? The ecological economic thought is not something that you, you will find in, in any other uh, book or paper. So now we have focus on the links between the natural and social sciences and then apply to economic thinking in terms of common, a common ontology and epistemology about these social ecological systems, right? So we already took the, the ontological criteria. So ontology is whatever exists, right? So it's reality, what we deem is part of reality. What is out there? What does exist? So we say, well, what do these communities think that exist out there, right? And we know that they take an approach based on embeddedness, which circles back to, to, to Thomas Cole and the painting and those, those different approaches. So if we set out from reality as being embedded, right, the economy, the social system, and, and nature, and then if we attribute another criterion, which is strong interdisciplinarity, which is a little bit tricky to, to make very clear what it is, but I would say in a very straightforward way that strong interdisciplinarity in our context here is avoiding any fundamental contradiction between the natural and the social sciences seems very obvious, straightforward, but this is not really what we observe, right? In economics, there are quite many strands of thoughts that would lead to fundamental contradictions with what the natural sciences are actually telling us. Just remember the, the concept of endless economic growth. Can there be such a thing in a finite planet have endless economic growth? So this is, I mean, this is something that's still in any economics 101 textbook. So we, we need to start to avoid these um, contradictions and actually build up common ontological and epistemological <laughs> presuppositions, right? So this is what I mean by this. And once you combine these two criteria, we had, well, so this is what we mean by ecological economic thought, right? And now we're going to look into the history and say, well, which episodes, chapters, ideas can we redeem thinking they are usable for our current predicament. And this, these are the chapters of, of the book, right? And uh, I'll show you in the next slide how they are actually, each one of them, they are about the relationship between economics or political economy and a field within the natural sciences. So here is depicted all the 10 chapters, right? For instance, we have uh, natural history back in the, the 1700s with Carl Linnaeus or, or Comte Buffon here in France, and actually how natural history has been sort of an engine for uh, economic development back then. We have, uh, for instance, um, social reformism, which is about chemistry, how does chemistry operate in political economy? And they were actually saying that there, were, that this, there was this a rift between the flows from the rural areas to, to the urban areas. And this flow should have been a cycle and it's not a cycle. So all the nutrients and flows of foodstuffs that come from the, from the land side and into big cities, they, they do not go back as residual. So they were saying that actually we need to close this cycle. So they were chemists trying to say, well, we need to close the biogeochemical cycle so that we do not have the kind of scarcity that we're having. Right, so literally, the, what they were saying is, let's get human excrements flowed down into the fields so that we can fertilize the fields, and thus production would increase uh, a lot. So these are the sort of examples, right? So 
economic ornithology in the turn of the 20th century in the US, for example, Forbes and Fernal, they were actually dissecting birds to look at what was in their stomachs to see what was the economic value of birds for plantations, for agriculture. So they were saying birds are economically very valuable. We need to protect these birds because they are eating all the bugs and pests that are eating our crops. So what exactly is the economic value of these birds? So this is another example of how we can actually combine natural and social sciences, right? So um, either, so, and then we go with uh, I, all these different fields, evolutionary biology, for example, or uh, this biosynology slash ecology in, in the early years of, of the Soviet Union, uh, land economics, uh, in Chernyshevsky also, he, which was um, a, a Russian thinker that was discussing and against Malthus, saying, well, your accounts on the productivity of land does not match the data, does not match the technology that we are using. So this is also about reconnecting natural sciences, in this case, so soil science, land science with the uh, political economy. So these are some of the examples of this history of ecological economic thought, right? So, and finally, during this investigation, we have come across some uh, examples of energy, energetics, and how it actually combines with political economy, right? So these are the three chapters of that book in which I said, well, now I need to go a lot more in depth into these chapters because there was just so much more doing the research for this, going to the archives and uh, whatever they were uh, writing. I saw actually a bigger community putting forth very different ideas, which I think might be very useful for how we perceive or, and think about economics today. So I will go a little bit more into detail into this uh, three, um, it's sort of a, a line, right? It's a timeline that goes all the way back from, from the 1700s until the beginning of the 20th century in, in German speaking countries. But before I do that, so very basically, I'm just going to say that this is about the assimilation of these laws of energetics or the flows of energy into economic thought in German speaking Central Europe. And this, I mean, this is not something that has not been done before, but it has been done before in very, very different ways. So we do have some publications and literature. For instance, the first one, which is probably the, one of the most famous ones by Philip Mirovsky, is called More Heat Than Light. And he was saying how the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy, how it actually shapes a lot of standard economics today. So how this um, mechanicist approach uh, to the conservation has actually spilled over to economics, right? There, there's this expression called physics envy, right? In, in, in economics that it's, uh, and this field suffers from physics envy because economists have been trying to look like physicists for a long time in order to get a little bit more credibility for their field. So their models, their equations, they are much, much in line with, uh, with classical physics. So we will not see any kind of um, losses, friction, this kind of thing. So for instance, uh, there's no irreversibility, no uncertainty, the notion of equilibrium, which is something that refers back to classical physics but do not account into a lot of what physics has done ever since, right? And especially the second law of thermodynamics, the entropy law, which is, that takes actually into account qualitative aspects and irreversibility and leads to this other view. We can, it has many names, organicis, holistic. Anyway, so what he was saying is that, well, there are parts of thermodynamics that led to standard economics. But I, what I am saying is that Laws of thermodynamics have also led into this very, very different set of ideas, which were completely in opposition to the conclusions of the, of the mainstream. Another book that I will cite quite quickly is uh, the second one, The Birth of Energy. So uh, Karen, you get, get it. She, she's saying that the, in England, right, especially in Glasgow, this, this names like uh, Lord Kelvin, Thompson, right, and uh, Rankin and Jules, Maxwell, what they were saying is that well, now we have discovered this laws of thermodynamics. We have to make all the efforts we, we can in order to build up our steam engines and make use of this new knowledge for the sake of the industrial revolution, for building up 
capitalism, the British Empire. So this is a very different way in which the laws of thermodynamics have actually been uh, understood and assimilated into political economy, right? So this was a, a much more pro uh, in industry, economic growth, a kind of view that we had from the same set of ideas. So this is all very interesting to me how we would have in Central European economic thought a very dissenting line of thinking based on the same laws, especially the, the first and second laws of thermodynamics. So there we go. We start all the way back in from German natural philosophy, which was this pushback that I mentioned, back, I mentioned in the beginning against the Enlightenment, the mechanicist view of nature, and uh, actually was talking about embeddedness and uh, the flows and, and of energy and matter. It actually begins, it begins, or at least Goethe is one of the main figures. He's seen by all this tradition as the first energeticist, right? So he's not only the poet and the writer that we know, but he's also, uh, he was also a scientist. So even in his fiction, like the, the Sorrows of Young Werther, there is this whole discussion about energy and draining swamps and building dams and making use of the powers of nature for um, uh, for the sake of this, this, this new uh, si emerging science, right? And this in turn has impacted the main breakthroughs in thermodynamics by names in Central Europe. And when I say Central Europe, we'll, we'll see some, some characters not only from Germany, but also Austria, Poland, Slovenia, Czech Republic, although most of them were, were writing only in, in, in German, or at least mostly in German. One of these big breakthroughs, for instance, we have uh, Rudolf Clausius, right, which is sort of a well-known uh, physicist. He's also written a book called about the energy reserves of nature and their and the, the, the value as human uses, in which he was actually arguing for a solar budget. Humans should not live beyond the means, and the means were sunlight. So the solar energy is the ultimate source of energy, and then anything that goes beyond that would be seen as uh, sort of unnatural or uh, at least very much dangerous in the sense that uh, this is an open system. There's this things called the, the laws of thermodynamics, right? Entropy also in, always increases in an open system. You always need more energy, right? There's no magic around this. But then my focus lies instead on other figures that have actually occupied themselves most of the time with the applications to social and economic phenomena of the laws of energetics, right? So I, rather than looking at uh, the main names uh, in the middle of the 19th century, I'm actually looking at other figures, which came or, again from the 1880s to the 1930s, and who actually had um, not as much impact as the as of the first ones, right? So this, all these ideas, they, they arise, but they also died very quickly uh, from the 30s on, onwards. And there are many reasons for that. One might be the, the 1929 crisis and how all of a sudden supply was not the problem anymore, demand was the problem. So instead of having enough to provide for everyone, the problem was, well, we, we have already produced too much and nobody's buying it. So all of a sudden, their works were seeing, well, we don't need this anymore. We actually need people to start producing more, growing. We need the economy to grow more because of the recession of 1929. Mm -hmm. So the focus on, on the works has sort of been brushed aside. But again, my hypo hypothesis is that there's some valuable insights to be drawn from, from their work. So there you go. I, my, my research is then divided into these three main groups. So Edward Zaha is sort of a, a lone wolf that became, came before everyone and one of the first to, to actually propose these this stories. I'm going to go into a little bit more on him. And then we have figures which were gravitating around Wilhelm Oswald, also another big name, Nobel Prize winner. And they were actually writing papers for his journal. He, he edited the, the, uh, the Natural Philosophy, right? The Annals of Natural Philosophy. And finally, the so-called other Austrian economics, right? Which were some very heterodox thinkers and not at all aligned with what we usually 
understand as Austrian economics, which is a quite more of a, a libertarian take on things. But in order to do so, I also needed some some guidelines or questions, right, to keep uh, my focus. And the tools would be economic value. So where does economic value come from? This is a, sort of a, still a big discussion within political economy. Where actually do we perceive things as, as valuable or economically valuable at least? And also resource accounting, how to actually take stock of these flows and uh, of energy and matter so that we can actually make sense of our provisioning systems. And finally, social reform. What kind of conclusions in ethical, social, and political terms can be drawn from um, their premises. So this is uh, Edward Zaha. Um, so his social mechanics, right? See, so his first book is from 1881, and it's then one of the first to develop this whole treatises of political economy. And this is also part of my process of selection of these figures, right? They were the, those, those that actually were building thorough frameworks of economic theory. If you look into their, to their books, you know, they have chapters like capital and labor and currency, money, uh, rents and profits, uh, production functions. So they were actually working and writing as they, if they were political economists, but with, one foot also in, in social in the natural sciences or at least in thermodynamics. I mean, Eduard Zaha was actually uh, it was an Austrian professor of chemistry in the Royal Imperial Institute for Education for Teachers in in not in Vienna. He was in in Krems. But anyway, so he was um, the main thing here is the formal treatment of human labor as a form of energy that constitutes the material base of social systems, right? So labor is seen as the main mechanism in which we energy flows into the economic system, right? So even when I am, when, when for any labor, any kind of labor, the final energy that is appropriated from that labor needs to be higher than the energy that's actually being used Right, so if I pick up an apple, the energy that I spent picking up that apple needs to be smaller than the energy contained in the apple. Otherwise, why would I do it? Right, so and this is called the minimum energy productivity of labor, or it's also been called the Podolinsky principle. Because in the same year, in 1881, there was a Ukrainian physician called uh, Sergei Podolinsky who actually was drawing the same theories and arriving the same conclusions. Actually, Podolinsky was working with uh, French official statistics in agriculture to calculate these flows of energy into the crops and how they then spilled over to other sectors of the economy. And Zaha was doing the same for the Habsburg Empire. So there you go. These are the first assessments of energy flows in agriculture. Right? And Juan Martinez Allier in his book is already saying, well, so these are the two fathers of, of social energetics. Sergei Podolinsky and Eduard Zaha. But there's still a lot to, to be, be known about the, the works of Zaha. He has not written just this. So I, I've been already in Vienna to look into archives and books and how his works have, have, have actually been uh, received by the community. There was a lot of uh, conversations and, and publications in newspapers and magazines at the time, either, either in favor or against um, his work. He has devised something that uh, is his view of economic value, which I call energetic labor theory of value, right? This is also something that you will not see anywhere else. There is something called labor theory of value in the sense that all economic value comes from labor, right? Which was the vision espoused by the classical political economists like Karl Marx, David Ricardo. So they were saying, well, all value comes from labor which is very different from the theory of value that we have today in economics, which, which is very subjective and based on utility. Whatever buyers feel it's, or think it's valuable, that's valuable. We as consumers decide what's valuable or not. So this is the, 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 the accepted view today in, in economics. It's based on the notion of utility, uh, right? But also has any kinds of problems. For instance, it doesn't separate between very much basic needs and luxuries, for example. They are 
So for economics, it's all the same, right? If it has a high uh, energy content or if it has a lot of pollution associated with it, I don't care, as long as the consumer decides, it's, it's valuable, it's valuable. And so this is something called the consumer sovereignty. Consumers are the sovereign to, to decide. So this is sort of something that it goes around and, and keeps away from, from, from this accepted view. And in this so-called energetic labor theory of value, although labor is the source of value, it is only so because it is the mechanism through which energy goes inside the social system, right? It is only valuable because it transforms energy in some form. And at the limit, even intellectual labor, at, at that time, for Oswald and others, it was about psychic energy. Intellectual labor was about energy processes inside our heads, which sound a little bit reductionistic, and it is, but uh, not always they were espousing these very reductionistic views. Right? More subjective approaches were present. It is also something, some part of my conclusions I would see. But so I'm not going to all the details. We still need to see the other two uh, groups. So I'm going to move forward to close up on, on Zaha. I'm just going to mention that his, so his social reform and the conclusions that he draw from, from this such premises is that rent and profit were not based on transformation of energy. It was actually parts of society which were appropriating energy without actually producing or any energy. So this was morally reproachable, right? And although he was not a revolutionary thinker in a, in a Marxist sense, he was a reformist. So he was not trying to get rid of capitalism. He was trying to reform it so that uh, labor would be the measure not only of value creation, but also of value distribution, right? So distribution had to be according to the amount of dispended labor and also the quality of this, of the, of this energy which will come also in other figures, it's not only about the amount of energy, but also the quality of that energy as per the, the law of entropy. Uh, he mentioned something very uh, interesting, which is the positive feedback loop between, between poverty and overproduction. I mean, this is also something that we experience today. It's 21st century, we have poverty and we have overproduction. So, how can we actually rethink these things? And he was actually giving very specific reasons why we had overproduction and, and poverty. And so, so there was this long depression in the 1870s. So also in that, in that time, he was perceiving a lot of things that were being produced and not being able to, to sell in the market, right? There was this excess supply and still there was a lot of poverty. So this was something that was completely un irrational for him. And he was then looking into the reasons for that. So exactly uh, because we believe that value comes from either a time or space, time meaning rent. So the money as a commodity that can actually generate interest is something that was for him one of the sources of this problem. The other thing was uh, uh, when talking about resources, it's basically land. So the private ownership of land was also a, a problem associated with this disconnect between production and, and consumption. Uh, the inheritance of property-based Roman law of um, labor contracts and how they were very leonine, so in, in, their, in, their, in their distribution. So laborers, which we were actually appropriating and, and actually producing right, uh, energy content, were not being uh, remunerated for that. And finally, in that a little bit more liberal uh, area in which you had a lot of deregulation going on, he was arguing that this is also a, a sort of cause for such unequal uh, outcomes. So, and he was calling for so this, this equalizing social institutions, price and wage controls, this sort of thing. And finally, so that there is this focus again on public ownership of land, state-led production, but much more than that. So this is not about all sectors of the economy, but cooperatives. So cooperativism is the main thing. And actually he finishes the book saying, well, here's my address, write to me, let's build a cooperative together. This is something that is mind blowing at the end of this big treatise in political economy. He gives his own address and says, well, just call me, let's, let's do this cooperative together. 
Why? So that we do not need to get all a, a, a big part of our uh, energy outcomes, right? Our energy uh, surpluses and give it away for for uh, private owners. Similar things were again in the in the Annal and the Natur philosophy, right? It's a little bit before, so it's already in the in the first decades of the 20th century. Oswald was a very well-known figure. There were a lot of thinkers uh, gravitating around him. And he was the editor of this journal. And oh. this journal, I mean, it's, it's just amazing to, to take a look at, at all the, the editions and, and all the papers that have been published there. There is a strong, so not everything is about energy, but there was a strong emphasis on this, this very broad um, impact of energetics in other human, social, cultural issues, all the way from uh, biological uh, related phenomena, economical, moral, and even in literature, psychology. So he was saying, uh, not him, right? So in the journal, you will see all these different fields trying to relate themselves to the laws of thermodynamics. But it was also a lot more than these uh, views, which retrospectively, so today, if we look into the historiography, you see, well, yeah, but this is all a little, a little bit too much, right? This is very reductionistic in the sense that you cannot transform subjective processes such as uh, we see in social systems and political systems, you cannot just say that everything is about energy, right? We need to qualify this discussion a little bit more. You, it's also been seen as technocratic in the sense that it was calling for the rule of uh, the scientific experts. Scientific experts, they knew how energy would flow and they would, were the best ones to tell us how we should organize ourselves. So this is a technocratic, right? Which is be also understood as something quite authoritarian. And even worse would be the calls for social Darwinism, which was at the time everywhere and also in this journal, so calling for the survival of the fittest, right? Only the individuals which were able to appropriate energy would survive and the rest would die and that's fine. So one of my takes is that we need to go move beyond the view that well, this was all that energetics had to say when combining political economy. There were other authors that were saying very, very different things. And this is actually where it gets pretty much interesting. I, so again, there were many people writing and talking about different things. So the different energetic labor theories of value, they not always matched. They did all get behind this moral imperative for seizing energy. They all did have this outlook of a science-based, but also ethics-based uh, social reform. Right, saying, well, what the capitalist system needs is to look into the natural sciences, but also into ethics. And one, one, one of the, the, the issues which were discussed, for instance, was, and this is all, again, my take, there's a lot more social lawmarkism than social Darwinism. So social lawmarkism is by means of education, we can change actually uh, uh, the, the lives of the individuals. So not a, there's no such thing as a survival of the fittest, right? With, uh, with social um, organization, we can actually uh, get rid of that and say, well, by means of education and proper jobs, and, how, and depending on how we organize, then we do not need to say, well, these people will die, these people will live, right? So this is social anarchism. So all of this reformist and planning and progressive social policies about health, education, and so forth. Uh, an organic view, again, I, I've talked about that already, the role of markets and how to get markets aligned with the common good. Again, this is, was not a, a revolutionary take of you know, like the revolution of the proletariat, but rather how can we make markets serve the common good and not the other way around. And finally, and I'm going to stress this in the end, is this separation between basic human needs, preferences and luxuries but also using science. So there was this objective assessment based on physiology. So there we go. All these figures have been, have written more than one uh, article in the journal. Some of them, uh, for instance, Oswald, that's Solvay, they are a little bit more well-known, but they did not delve into 
political economy as much. Perrin was uh, coming from a Marxist perspective, so it's also someone that I, I decided not to look into at this very moment. And then I looked into Rudolf Goldscheid, Oskar Nagel, and uh, Ivan Jimatz. So these are the three ones which I will look into because of the depth of their analysis in political economy. But here, I'm not going into all these details, but just to see how, although there was a common a common line of thought um, behind their, their theories. They were actually talking about uh, things in different terms and with different conclusions, different premises. But for instance, when you talk about uh, value or uh, theories of value, then we will see that they were also espousing uh, this energetic labor theory of value, but also combining with founder uses again. So what consumers do with a good should also determine the value of that good, right? Having a gun or a glass of water should not be seen, you know, the fact that these goods are different in that way could also be taken into account into how valuable these this, this products are. And finally, there's the other Austrian economics, which is supposed to be the last part of the project, which were not so much into energy, but they were saying that this, so this, this instead of this, this closing stocks of energy and matter, it was the flows and stocks of everything that's physical. So not only, so we're not going to only into energy units, but uh, food or uh, clothing or housing. So there were actually all these different units, right? Square meters when it goes to housing, yards of cloth when it goes to clothing. So it's, they were actually putting up this very complex planned economy in which actually you do not need money. So you do not need money into putting up this in-kind economy. So this is a very big debate in economic that dates back to this time. And Neuhardt was one of the main uh, uh, characters of this, uh, of this uh, debate. I mean, this is an ongoing thing, right? So do we really need money? For instance, what about for very basic needs, stuff like water and food and housing and clothing? Should we rely on the market or not? And uh, for instance, Joseph Popolinke was saying that not. He had this very unusual idea that, well, instead of having a military conscription, what we, we had a civil conscription. So in for a few years, all of us would work in, for, in whatever sector of this basic needs economy. And after that, we will all have our basic needs satisfied for free for the rest of our lives. So this is sort of a unusual a bit out there but quite illustrative so it's a version of the universal basic income basically right so as I, as I run out of time i'm going to draw some conclusions so first uh, i can already see there's both a commonality between all these figures but also a lot of diversity of thought if on the one side we have this moral imperative for seizing energy or satisfying basic human needs. On the other, the energetic labor's theory of value, they are very different between themselves. It, it can be either based on labor alone, it can be either uh, taking into account the final uses, as I said. And also there was commonality in terms of this science-based and ethics-based reform of the capitalist system, but also what does that mean? So it also, is very diverse in terms of these discussions around social law marxism, technocracy, what role should scientific experts actually take in, a, in government, to put it simply. The role of markets and luxuries, should, role, should markets play a role, right? For instance, for Papa Link, I was saying, yeah, well, yes, but only for luxuries. For luxuries, you know, it's a competitive economy. And anyone can buy, produce, and sell what they want. But if it's a basic need, then we need, uh, we need to actually make sure that everyone has enough of that. And what does it all say about the relations between energetics, value, and social reform, right? And also trying to bring this a little bit more to the 21st century. So the first point is quite historiographical and how I'm going to try to show that in different strands of thought connecting energetics and economic thought, we will move beyond reductionism, technocracy, and social Darwinism and views which are sort of seen in the historiography, as I mentioned in, in, in the literature, right, uh, in those books. 
But if we really want to grapple with energy in economics and ethics, then we do need to take a look at some, some aspects. For instance, differentiating between basic needs and preferences. So preferences meaning also luxuries and comforts. Right? Shouldn't this be a form of categorization within economic science? Does it not play a role in our life today, to, especially in a time of crisis and multiple catastrophes, which are which is the 21st century is supposed to be? So how do we actually make sure that we survive in the 21st century? If we want to survive, what we need is basic needs. We don't actually need luxuries. So although luxuries is not something that we actually need to be have at the core of public policy, basic needs are. We have seen that with COVID, so health, uh, education, and, and food, and this kind of stuff is actually something that we are going to have a lot of problems in the next decades. So can we maybe look into alternatives to a free market and actually are we able to plan an economy using not only money as a unit of analysis, but different uh, physical units, if you will? Can we actually do that and plan accordingly for what, what, has, what, what lies ahead of us? So I, I am very much interested in looking into how to differentiate basic needs and preferences in economics. The second point is the question of overproduction. How, what is overproduction? What exactly it is? It does it entail the quality of product or just the quantity? How is it connected to endless economic growth? So actually, do, do we need to have a conversation about production, right? And what is overproduction? And finally, should we strive for a so-called social ecological calculation debate. Right? The debate that I said that was present in the beginning of the 20th century is known as the socialist calculation debate. So it's of a pun, right? So the socialist calculation debate and the social ecological calculation debate is actually saying that shouldn't we start calculating these flows and stocks of matter and energy and draw some insights and models and theories and policies out of them so that we make sure that we survive for the for some time to come at least. This is sort of the my my long-term goal and the long time and the, the long-term goal of, of, of my research. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>